All right. Uh, someone talk about when FTV or the, when there's a catastrophe with FTV. Um, a little introduction. Brandon and I are both with Wavefront. Uh, we're both in the operations team. And I've been at Wavefront for more than three years. Uh, but we've been running FoundationDB as the core data platform for the service for more than, I don't know, four or five years. Um, so we'll, we'll go over a little bit about a background on Wavefront and then uh, two case studies. So this talk is titled Restoring FTB After Catastrophe. But it's really about managing FTB when your infrastructure decides to break on you. And that's important because over the time we've been using FTB, we haven't had issues with FTB itself. It's always been something related to infrastructure. And as Evan said, the database runs on computers and disks. Those tend to break. So a little bit of background on Wavefront. For those of you who aren't aware, Wavefront is a cloud-native uh, monitoring platform. It's a time series observability platform. And as I mentioned, we use FTB as, a, as the primary data store. So we've taken all this data and we make sense of it in either alerts or charts. But, but more, most importantly, mostly charts. Because sometimes your data looks like this, or like this, or even like this. And since we're arguably in the fish taco capital of the world, sometimes your data looks like this. And that's an actual wavefront chart. So I'll talk a little bit about how Wavefront uses FTB to sort of set some context. Uh, we run a lot of FTB. When I put this together, we had 90-some uh, clusters. So that's about, I think it was uh, seven or two instances, you know, just under 19,000 processes. So not a small, not a small deployment. Um, and since Evan used last year's slides, I'm going to also use some of last year's slides to kind of show you what Wavefront looks like. Uh, to help you understand um, how it can break for us. So super high level, this is a very simplified view of a Wavefront cluster. There are three tiers. There's this web server tier, an application tier, and then a database tier. And importantly, Wavefront runs active-active, so what you see here is duplicated on that little blue square that's not uh, filled out. And if I take a 30,000 square fo uh, 30, foot view, um, this is what it looks like. So we have this front end or the web servers I showed you. And then we have the duplicate services either in two different AZs or two different regions. And on the bottom there is, of course, uh, FDB. So I mentioned sometimes the infrastructure decides it doesn't want to cooperate. So I'm going to bring, let Brandon talk about the case of the missing kernels. Okay, cool. So, all right, uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, the case of the missing kernels. So, a little bit of background. Uh, this was something that happened earlier this year. Um, we were, our database tier was still pretty much on Trusty, uh, which is, you know, a version of Ubuntu Linux. Um, our, for data storage, we were currently using EBS for all of the uh, FTB storage. And at the time, we were mostly on the 3.3 kernel, which is, uh, was kind of the stock kernel at the time. But based on some recommendations uh, from working with Amazon, they'd recommend updating to a 4.4 kernel. Uh, that was supposed to improve some things. Um, and at that time, also, we had a few clusters that we had running on Xenial with a 4.4 kernel, where we were testing moving to using the local NVMe instant storage. So uh, this is a graph of TCP retransmits. This is on uh, 3.3, OK, before we start putting out the 4.4 kernel. Uh, we put out the 4.4 kernel. You can kind of see, you know, scope-wise, it's under one. We switch the 4.4 kernel on some clusters, and uh, we start to see pretty bad <laughs> TCP retransmits. A lot of other things look fine. In fact, uh, you know, it didn't kind of manifest itself as a big problem for a little while, and the kernels had started trickling out to some of our clusters. Um, so, right, big jump. Um, so we say, okay, uh, this isn't working. Uh, we're kind of able you know, look at graphs, look at times, realize, OK, it definitely is the new kernel. Um, in fact, we do some verification, some testing to verify that, switching between kernel versions on some of our test clusters. Um, then we go back. So you can see things look much better afterward. So OK. Um, so now at this point, right, uh, we have this mixed kernel version. We really want to get everything back to 
um, at the same time, we're also doing in-place FDB upgrades, which for us is, um, because we have this active-active model, we can be serving on one mirror and we'll actually stop FDB, do an in-place upgrade. Um, and since we're kind of pausing the world on that one mirror while we do that, we thought, okay, well, we'll go ahead and get these kernel versions consistent with a reboot, because that's relatively quick. So we're working through, you know, doing these upgrades in general, it's going well. But as I mentioned, there's a little bit of a wrinkle where um, some of the clusters are Xenial with 4.4. So, right, multiple, multiple clusters are being upgraded at the same time. Things seem like they're going well. You get in a groove. Uh, one of the Xenial clusters, we run the uh, trusty steps, which include purging all the 4.4 kernels, you know. And there's some sanity checks there. This is all kind of manual playbook with Ansible. And so, uh, you know, working on the mirror cluster, go to the reboot, they're not coming back up. Okay, this was Xenial. We have no kernels. We're stuck at Grub. Do I still have a job? Actual quote. Um, so, you know, first things first, we call it AWS. Is there anything we can do? Is there any way we can somehow get at the boot volumes of these instances? Because the boot volumes are EBS. We can slide another kernel in there in some way. Otherwise, basically, data gone. Basically, they say no. For various, you know, technical constraints and a lot of them around, you know, not being able to get a customer data, encryption things, basically no. So that's gone. 20 terabytes of data, gone. Okay, so how do we get out of this? FTBDR. Um, at this point, we had upgraded uh, part of this cluster to FTBDR, to a version that had it available. Um, you know, so we knew it existed, but it wasn't something we'd actually used yet. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we start doing some research. As I mentioned earlier, we have test clusters. Um, so this is actually uh, a very cool thing that we're able to do where we can build uh, a full wavefront cluster and we have the ability to replay data out of our production monitoring into test clusters so we can give them a good volume and a good data shape. So we take one of those clusters, we build through the runbook, we basically you know, figure out what we think the process will be to drop new nodes, you know, set up backup agent or DR agent, all that. It works, okay. So testing in production, sort of. Now I say testing in production, sort of, because like I mentioned, you know, we, we went through the whole process once on one of our test clusters to verify it works, you know, get everything out of the way. Um, so then with our detailed run book in hand, we go through setting it up, uh, wire everything up, data starts moving, 20 terabytes, many, many hours of data later, it works, uh, it's done, everything's caught up, you know. And so we disable the FDBDR, the link basically, we break that. So now this, this other cluster is uh, independent, do a bunch of tests for functionality and correctness. Cluster has high availability again, we're back in action. Okay, so what did we learn? Um, first thing, well hey, now we have a pretty thorough, pretty good FDBDR runbook. Built it under duress, but it works. Another thing that kind of came out of this part of this process was, okay, realizing um, now that we're you know, gonna shift more and more to using NVMe only instances because it's a significant improvement in uh, you know, available disk I.O., um, we actually started making some IAM policies, right? We run an AWS around how these instances could potentially be stopped and started. Because that's the main drawback is the instance stopped, those local disks are gone. So uh, you know, we improved some things there. Automate checks. Um, automate more of the process, right? We, like I said, we had a few things in Ansible, but uh, you know, some of it was copy and like a runbook, right? You copy this command, you copy that command. Um, okay, automate more of that. Add more automated health checks. Um, and that's also a thing that we took to you know, other routine procedures in other places. Um, and then finally, fleet replace. So fleet replace is a term that we use to, you know, you have an entire FDB cluster, and what we, what we will do is we'll actually launch like a whole new set of instances, and we refer to it as a fleet replace using the native ex exclude, in include um, capabilities of Foundation EB. So this is actually uh, just for, in general operations, uh, something that we have had a lot of success with and, and very much rely on, um, right? As we scale away from clusters up and down um, based on point rate and demand, uh, we have a, a process of deciding how many instances we use and what size. 
And so, you know, in the case of going up or down, we will launch those new instances, bring them in. We have a whole Ansible-based process that goes through and right, makes sure coordinators are moved, uh, starts the excludes, uh, you know, depending on whether it's SSD or memory-based, we have a different process for that. Uh, and at the end, does a bunch of health checks. Right? Is it healthy? Are there any unreachable processes? Just kind of going through all these things. Um, and so having that process in place, and in fact, in some ways, maybe I'm you know, learning from this experience, uh, in, you know, adding more robust health checks, looking for more corner cases automatically. Um, we also decided, okay, things like kernel upgrades, we can do with a fleet replace. Because what we found is that uh, FDB, as long as it's running, it doesn't care, right? You're currently running on trusty instances and you drop Bionic, that's fine. In fact, we went through that process with all of our databases during the middle of this year. Completely moved all the Bionic and, you know, four to 15 or whatever the current kernel is, which has also been good. Um, yeah. So this is where I'm gonna hand it back to MRZ to talk about some other things we learned. All right, we are running on EBS, or we were. Uh, in an EBS world, we had a couple uh, problems we'd run into. Either EBS would have a catastrophic failure, and since we had a duplicate copy of your data in another mirror, we could copy it. And the other, other use case for us is to take an existing uh, data set and just copy it someplace else. So I'll kind of walk you through what we did from a process standpoint. So, uh, very, very important, you should back up your coordinators. We track that by using um, uh, instance tags, or I'm sorry, volume tags, so we could kind of relate the volumes back to where the coordinators were. And then we stopped the cluster, and we did an EBS snapshot. So those are the simple steps. But the important thing is make sure you keep track of your coordinators. And then the lengthy piece was to, to resurrect those snapshots on other machines. We were using LVM, so part of it was to also uh, make sure LVM came back up and then fix the coordinators uh, and redistribute the cluster config to all the members and then restart the database, pray and hope and wait. And so what that, what that looked like uh, on the file is we would have a set of machines that were the origin machines and we would copy the cluster elsewhere. We just simply hand edited the file even though it says do not hand edit, we actually did that. And then would, um, I think we were lazy, we just SCP'd it out. And then we started back up. And so. These were the six steps we had, but I think the important thing was we had always thought that this could work, and then we were in a situation where we had to figure out, does it actually work? And uh, I'm just gonna read from my notes here. So this actually worked because the coordinators keep track of the topology of the cluster. And so as everything came back online, they checked in with the existing coordinators and then update all the, um, essentially update, and all the shards will be accounted for. And behind the scenes, the bytes on disk must be rematerialized from the snapshot. And I think this took, um, well, a matter of hours, it was not fast. Uh, but we've done this, I think, um, at least once, maybe twice now. Uh, it's a great way to copy an existing production instance someplace else, if you can afford the downtime to do the snapshots. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's all we had. I don't know if we have a little, we have four minutes for questions, if there's any questions. I'll say as an aside, uh, the TCP segment retransmission we saw was not catastrophic until it was because processes would join the cluster, trans retransmit so much, they'd fall back out, and so the cluster was thrashing. So on larger clusters, um, it was never stable. And then we looked at all the charts and we saw this piece. That was on the, if you care, it was on a 4, 15, uh, 10, 37 kernel. Don't use that one. Oh. This is not using that yet. This is just using EBS snapshots. I have not looked at that. I'm not sure anymore because we're now not using EBS anymore. We've moved over entirely to NVMe because uh, I have infinite IO, which seemed to be one of the gating factors to uh, running a high performance database. With the caveat that you have to put a lot of guardrails into uh, making sure humans don't destroy your fleet. You have to be able to monitor Amazon's infrastructure because they don't uh, they don't tell you about smart, but you don't get to look at that stuff, so you have to infer disk failures or pending disk failures by looking at, I think we're looking at the um, disk I.O. write queue length as an indicator when it starts to go not straight. Uh, it's an indicator that it may be time to just shut down FTV on that node and replace it. I think the other thing we did too is we, we put only a few processes on each actual physical uh, disk so that if one disk dies, the whole machine's not down, just the processes on those. All right, thanks. <laughs>